Hey folks, we're back looking again at the AR6. This report, you probably heard chatter in the news about the release of the short report. We did a video here on the channel. Long report came out. Have you heard anything? I haven't heard anything and I found out why. It's because it's wildly unreadable. It's the earthquake food of written material. It took me nine hours to read this 85 page report. Not only is it wildly dense, it also made me want to put my head in a bucket and scream a lot. But going through that experience, Translating this critical information, that's the service I provide. So our big question from the short form was, why do things look so much worse? Were there underlying changes in the modeling or were there changes in the risk assessment? The answer actually is both. I'm gonna explain how changes to modeling and changes to risk assessment factor in and why this report should not make you give up on what we have described as the RCP 4.5 future. So. Taking a step back to where I've geared my uh, forecasts on this channel, when I've taken a realistic look at climate models and at human behavior, I've assumed we were going to come in a little bit above two degrees total warming following the RCP 4.5 pathway. Bring us to a future that's not great, but one where we can get ready and where our preparations really have a realistic hope of helping us continue to live lives that are true to our values. The RCP 4.5 pathway had a range of uncertainty. And I know that many of you viewers were concerned about that upper edge of that range of uncertainty of how much warming it really described. On this and the other RCP models, the AR6 tightens the range of those cones of uncertainty. That's the big difference in the AR6 is how much tighter they feel about the models, how much more statistical confidence they have. The other big difference with the risk assessment is that they want to be very certain about not driving us into the upper limits of these tighter ranges. With the broad ranges, they weren't as concerned before, but the tight ranges, I think there's more confidence, modeling with more certainty, a better idea of where we need to steer on a policy level. And this is why there's those knocks on the old 4.5 model, even though honestly, all of the impacts we're going to feel in North America and I'm going to show you some differences in the North American outlook compared to the rest of the globe. It's it's just unsettling. Like I said, they're all going to probably fall within the previously described range of possibility because I was modeling for us around two, maybe a little bit over. And that is fundamentally what this report concludes. They were probably going to be able to steer down to two. They'd like to get us a little bit below. I'd still worth preparing for getting a little bit above. But I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean with something we all love, a probability table. I do love this probability table, although it gives you an excellent like uh, concept of how dense the whole report is, right? So over here, these are different pathways. This is kind of similar to what we've been talking about with 4.5. Let's get down here and look at the likelihood of peak global warming staying below 1.5, 2, and 3 degree. So that third column again, we were talking about good chance, better chance than not of staying below two, but at 59, you're not exactly passing the class, are you? The big action the report is calling for is switching down to one of these two pathways where we'd move from 59 to either a 73 or a 78% chance of staying below two. So that would be great, right? But it's actually not a huge change. We're talking about a blinking red light around this specific course correction. I'd like to point out the probability of staying below three is very good. Even if we did nothing more at all, the probability of staying below three is still looking good. And that I feel like is an unsung victory in this report is the degree to which we pulled away from four, which like that's a hellscape you don't want to live in, right? and the degree to which we're probably gonna hit under three. It's really cool. The report talks about some pathways where they'd like to stay below 1.5. The language that they use is a little optimistic, I think especially when we look at the numbers, even in the most heroic efforts that we might make at this point. You're talking about a third of a chance that we're gonna stay below 1.5. That's not that great, right? The odds of staying below two in those situations are good, but they're not so much different than these other pathways. I think that if we look at what our most likely future is, where not everybody makes the best possible choice or the worst possible choice, pretty good odds of staying below two, probably gonna come in around 2.1, 2.2, right? Just being realistic. Again, 
when we're talking about what's the bad news in this report, when we get into the numbers, the big difference is 59 to 73. That's not that big. That's less than a 20% difference. I think that we can probably make two degrees happen is another way to rationally read this report. We're in the process of doing the work. Don't forget, we just checked the curves recently in that rate of change video. We're on track to make the turn. This probability chart is also not totally shocking news for anyone who's really looked at the 4.5 pathway curves. Because the curves of that pathway, they don't describe a simple function. They describe multiple functions chained together, meaning that they require course correction. They require further action. In this report from a policy recommendation, they're telling us to turn the wheel a little bit harder in the next five years than we might have otherwise planned, make a few more greenhouse gas cuts before 2030 so that we can move from a 59% chance of staying below two to a 73% chance of staying below two. This report is not telling us we can't make that turn. Our most likely future is not one where the nations of the world take no further action to prevent climate change. No, it's one where they do kind of a not great job bringing us to our objectively lousier but not totally apocalyptic future. So let's take a step back and breathe out, right? Because you hear from a lot of people, we're heading to three degrees and everyone knows the three degree world is this horrifying looking. But you saw it in those probability charts. We're probably staying below three and we've turned away from four. We have turned away from the life destroying hellscape that would be a four degree warming. We should celebrate this as a human achievement. It's a correction we've made, but no one's talking about it. They want you to be scared instead of realistic. I think that we can solve these problems together more effectively if we take a realistic approach. And that means two degrees. And we shouldn't feel helpless. We got to keep pulling. The pull's got to come from the top. But people like you and me can make a big difference. If you are a person who wants to be involved on the ground, who wants to move beyond mitigation and start getting ready for your future, you got to help get the word out about our most likely future where we hit about two degrees think that if we look at what two is, we need to really understand it when we talk about that most likely future because it's rough and we need to know what we're up against. The global risks are what we can see best in this AR6 report, and they're not fair risks. In North America, the risks remain relatively low. Let me show you. So check this out. At two degrees here, in the US, we might be starting to worry about reduced viability of tourism. Whereas other people at two degrees would be worried about being able to get water to drink. It's, it's grossly unfair. One piece of information that's very important in this report, greatly explicated in the long-form report, are the revised and much higher risks to Central and South America. There's also substantial emphasis on revised higher risk, particularly water risk to the Mediterranean, to Australasia. I mean, check out the bars on the Australasia graphs there. To South and Central Asia and to Africa. We can see that here. I want to also show it to you visually. So here we can look at 1.52 and 3 degrees, the sort of changes that we would expect. We see by two scary hot spots really starting to form up in much of the lungs of the planet here in uh, South America. We see a lot of hot spots forming up in the Mediterranean. And we see in areas that already have water scarcity, and like in South Africa, some hot spots forming. And unfortunately, we see that those do overlay with substantial reductions in uh, projections for mean total column soil moisture. You'll notice that's very striking at two in South and Central America, very concerning. And the Mediterranean, South Africa, and this part of Southeast Asia that we've already highlighted as vulnerable from sea level rise, from killing heat, and now we see they're drying out too. Very dangerous global outlook. What else is looking rough? What else is looking challenging is the ocean. When we look at what's really different in the AR6, a lot of what's really different is related to the ocean and to sea level rise. The ocean has absorbed more than 90% of current warming trends. That's melting more ice faster than expected in earlier models. The AR6 indicates a narrowing of model range for sea level rise and it pulls it up. I want to show you this figure. This figure shows how many more people are likely to be impacted by sea level rise in 2040. Once again, you can see that North America is looking at a ludicrously small share of the problem compared to Asia in particular. 
It, it's just, we're vanishingly unimportant in terms of our total risk profile. This is also the first major report, consensus report, that seriously considers the possibility of total ice sheet collapse in Greenland and Western Antarctica. That potential collapse is not necessarily going to be correlated to higher temperature outcomes. It's quite possible that collapse is related to our not understanding how ice sheets work. If they collapse, we'd be talking about higher sea level rise, but don't envision it like a tsunami. If we're talking about high end sea level rise from a human perspective, we're talking about needing to move inland. And that could be positive. That could be a driver for the types of changes to urban design that we need, where we're going to be needing to have more sustainable cities to reduce the total greenhouse gas emissions of people in developed areas. Summing things up, in North America, we continue to have an unreasonably good hand. We have a lot of problems to deal with. We're feeling them already. But when you look at what everyone else is holding, you can't feel too bad about what we're up against. I anticipate I'm going to be able to provide you with better on-the-ground modeling in the fall. If you're in America, more info is coming. The fifth national climate assessment is not coming out until November now. That's a longer timeline than I'd heard we were looking at, but it is what it is. When we get that, which gives information specific for America and in great detail, I will be revising American Resiliency's 50 States project. I'll do it visually, sharing maps, figures, and projections based on the information we're going to get in that report. I'm going to get it to you, but I don't have it yet. The new modeling referenced in the IPCC report here, this AR6, much of what has changed in the deep modeling is our understanding of cloud feedbacks. So I'm hopeful in the fifth NCA, we'll have a better idea of precipitation trends over our country. That would be phenomenal for building resilience if we had some higher fidelity, higher confidence models of precipitation trends, like fingers crossed. Okay, this picture. We know more now. The long form AR6 report provides a lot more evidence than the short form report. They're releasing all the guts later, but this version, I felt like I got much better evidence and much clearer answers. The report lays out stuff we already knew as people who are climate aware. It lays it out crystal clear. We're going to 1.5. We're not gonna get out of this without a heavy hit. If you wanna get ready for the changes that are coming, here's what you can do. You can prepare for two degrees and you can help us make the turn. First thing you should do is get yourself in place. Figure out if you're in a place you wanna be in a two degree future. Check out your state level forecast and anticipate updated versions coming out starting in December after I've read and processed the fifth national climate assessment with release now anticipated in November. So if you're looking to move, you should check the destination region videos. There are solid locations there at two. They're survivable if things get heavy and we end up closer to three. Those destination regions, particularly the Northern Midwest and the Northeast, they're solid high capacity regions with good water outlook. The inland Pacific Northwest, it's got the lowest capacity, most challenging water outlook. It's got the highest rate of natural disasters, one of the nicest agricultural outlooks, and it's probably also the prettiest in the good years, best outdoor recreation. Once you're in place, think about what you can do to help make the turn. For most people, food and transportation changes are the best ways to reduce your carbon footprint. Food system changes could bring down emissions a lot, like it's half the picture. Relying more on local food systems, helping to develop and encourage local food systems, it's super important. If you can grow some of your own food, it's the best. For many people, reducing your consumption of meat is about the fastest way you can bring your footprint down. I'd also recommend avoiding palm oil. On transportation, don't jump to buying an electric car. Think about traveling a little less, make fewer trips to the store, avoid overseas travel. Find more ways to walk or bike. The way out of this is not going to be everyone has an electric car. It's going to be better public transit, more communities where it's safe or possible to walk or bike. You know, I think many of us who are interested in these things, we're already doing some of the work. And that's important because I want you to take a look with me. I found this shocking at how disproportionate emissions are. When we talk about emissions, 10% of households that contribute the most, they contribute 34 to 45%. The middle 40 contribute another 40 to 53%, and the bottom 50 contribute 13 to 15%. And we have to take a hard look at where we are in the U.S. If we want to talk about global wealth, in the U.S., the median household has a wealth of about $110,000. To be in the top 10% globally for wealth, you need about 135 k and I'm using median figures to cut out the billionaires. If we looked at an average instead of a median for the US, 
our average worth, if we left the billionaires in the pool, it would be eight times larger than the median worth. So we have a lot of financial power here. And many of us in the US, we probably are in that top 10% of emitters. There's a lot of room that we have to make cuts. And other developed countries like Europe, they have actually made deeper cuts than we did. We could do more. We have a lot of financial power. We have more than enough power to really work on solving these problems. But back to emissions, you know, most of us have heard these messages about how to reduce carbon footprint before. I think a lot of us are already doing the work. Not enough people have heard the message about how serious things are gonna get in some places. Not many people understand what it means even that we are at least going to a 1.5 degree of warming. So I hope get the word out. There is hope and it's right here in North America. We have a lot of power. There's a lot that we can do to make it happen and our outlook is great. We need to prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.